Thank you so much. Well, as a graduate of San Diego State University, it's wonderful to be back on this beautiful campus. And thanks to this institution, I have now been a San Diego resident for 35 years. But my childhood was a very different thing. My parents were Irish immigrants who came to this country with a baby under each arm. And they settled in a small farming community in rural Fresno County called Firebaugh. Now, my father spent 30 years in the rice business. But Firebaugh is much better known for one thing, and that's cantaloupes. Lots and lots of cantaloupes. Uh, we ate so much cantaloupe that we lost count. And the reality is that a lot of the crop that came to market was too odd size, too odd shape, that odd color, too ripe. And so it was just donated to the local community. We had as much cantaloupe as we could possibly eat. I'm not even sure I saw a sliced cantaloupe until we moved to Fresno, because we used to just cut them in half and eat them like a cereal bowl. <laughs> that, was our, that was our favorite uh, snack. And when we moved to Fresno, we, we built a house in the middle of a fig orchard. And I went from seeing thousands of cantaloupes to seeing millions of figs. And as kids, we wouldn't even go home for lunch. We would just eat figs off the tree. But we saw this vast amount of produce never go to market because, again, there was not a market for it. The farmer simply had to throw the crop away. The food was simply going to be wasted. So now I live in San Diego. And I am proud to lead an organization that takes the lessons of my childhood, takes the reality of food waste, and is using it to solve the critical problem of hunger. Hunger is a debilitating personal condition. If you think about the things that people need to grow and to thrive, you can almost imagine a baseball diamond, where home base is education, job training, child care. But you can't get to home base until you've rounded third, which is health care. We need to heal the bodies and minds and preserve the health of everyone in our communities. But you can't get to third base until you've hit second base, which is housing. Because all of us need a safe, secure place to put our head down at night. But you can't even get there until you get to first base. And that's hunger. Because hunger is debilitating. When you are hungry, children cannot learn in school. Workers cannot perform on the job. We cannot expect excellence and success. And we certainly cannot expect self-sufficiency because hunger is absolutely debilitating. The statistics on hunger are pretty staggering for a country as affluent as ours. My organization, Feeding San Diego, is a member of Feeding America, who does a map the meal gap study every year. And it projects that just here in San Diego County, we have a situation where one out of every eight people is facing hunger on a regular basis. Tragically, the rate is even higher amongst children where one out of every six kids is what we call food insecure, meaning they lack regular access to healthy and nutritious foods. But Feeding San Diego is working to tackle this problem on a daily basis. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we do that. But the first question I often get, well, who are these people? Who are they? I look around San Diego. I see affluence. I see wealth. How could it possibly be that so many people are struggling with hunger? It must be the homeless population. Well, the homeless population is about 10% of where our food ends up going. It's a critically important part of our mission. But 90% of the food is going to people who are doing everything within their power to not become homeless. Many of them have three jobs. They're the hardest working people I've ever met in my life. Single parents that are struggling to get by. People who have fallen on hard times. Seniors, veterans, active duty military families, children, the disabled. People who live in rural parts of the county, so-called food deserts where their limited income and lack of transportation means that they don't have access to inexpensive and affordable groceries. It's people who look a lot like the woman in this photo, uh, who I met recently in one of our small rural eastern communities in our county, who told me that she lived a beautiful middle class life. She was a senior accountant at a major corporation. She and her husband were doing great until he got cancer. And in the 10 years from the date that he was diagnosed, to the date that he passed, they liquidated all of their assets. They spent everything they had trying to save his life. She's now left living in a dilapidated mobile home in a trailer park. She doesn't own the land that the home sits on. The rent keeps going up, and she's struggling to survive on Social Security. And when she told me the story, she had sunglasses on. And she said, I am so ashamed to be here getting free food. And I said, after listening to your story, it's all of us collectively, who should be ashamed that you have to come to this distribution. It's people like the military families we serve. And I recently let 
a, a mother of three uh, at a distribution just outside of Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, California. And she was telling me that her husband is in the uniform of our country, serving overseas in a combat zone. And she and her children are struggling with food insecurity right here in San Diego County. And as we were talking and we rounded the corner and she saw our free farmer's market style food distribution with five different types of fruits and vegetables, with canned goods and box goods, and she was handed shopping bags and told, you get to get 20 to 25 pounds of free groceries for you and your family, and you can do this twice a month. She was just overwhelmed. And she said, this is for us? And I said, yes, please, this is for you. And she, she started crying, I started crying. It was kind of a messy situation, but I don't take a lot of pride in having to serve active duty military families. I think that's a situation that all of us collectively should feel some sense of shame. Um, but it's a problem that we can and should solve, not just for those families whose, whose loved ones are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, but for all our families, for all of our children, for all of our seniors. I am really proud to lead an organization that is taking a very innovative approach to a very old problem. Feeding San Diego's lens is focused almost exclusively on rescuing food that would otherwise go to the landfill. The data on that is absolutely staggering. The truth is that 40%, 40% of the food in this country goes to waste every day. Literally within a mile of our landfill, food is being, uh, children are going to bed hungry while the food that could have fed them is being thrown away. And that's a tragedy that must be averted. So my organization is relatively new, and it was started by a group of people who approached this from a clean sheet of paper way of thinking. They wanted to analyze data, they wanted to analyze resources, they wanted to assess the cost per meal delivered of various methodologies, and they landed on a model which is working. It's cost efficient, and it is scalable, and it holds the potential to actually solve the problem of hunger throughout our communities. But there's more than just an opportunity to solve hunger. There's also an opportunity to avert an environmental disaster because the truth is that food waste has numerous serious environmental consequences. Take, for example, the resources that go into growing the food that we produce. The amount of farmland that we dedicate to growing the food we throw away is roughly the size of Pennsylvania. It's about 30 million acres. That's 8% of all farmland in the United States dedicated to growing food we throw away. You add to that about 800 million pounds of pesticides, 2 billion pounds of fertilizer, and 4 trillion gallons of water to grow that food. Then you add the labor to harvest it, the packaging, the shipping, the cold storage, the trucks, this massive system of food procurement, processing, and distribution that all leads to the landfill. That's a massive squandering of our national resources for no good. But worse, when the food hits the landfill, it generates methane gas, which contributes to climate change. And that's something that none of us should have a tolerance of. About a third of the landfills in my state are dedicated to organics, mainly food. And they are the leading emitter of methane gas from those landfills. And so it's vitally important that we consider climate change in the context of solving hunger and recognize we have an opportunity to solve two problems at the same time. And what could be better than that? So this is a model that is easily scalable, we have achieved tremendous momentum, and it stands in stark contrast to traditional approaches, because honestly, traditional approaches are often heavily leveraged on new food, on purchased food. We ask the federal government to buy commodities and give them to organizations that can distribute. We ask the state government to buy more commodities so that we can distribute them in our communities. We even ask you, the consumers, to buy extra food in the grocery store so that we can use that food to solve hunger by putting it in a barrel. Uh, but you look in those barrels, and you know what you see? You see a lot of canned and boxed food, a lot of sodium, salt, sugar, carbs. When you look out the back door of the grocery store, you see going to the landfill thousands of pounds of dairy, proteins like chicken and meat and fish and produce, and you see other goods that have a, a best buy date problem on them. But of course, the best buy date is not a food safety date. We all need to understand that. That is a freshness date. That is not a federally regulated date. That is a date that is chosen uh, by the manufacturer to express their confidence in the best taste of the product. But we work directly with the national food manufacturers to establish what the actual food safety dates are. 
and we know the range at which those products can be distributed. So if you go to the grocery store and you see that donation barrel and you go in and you buy a can of soup for a dollar and you put it in that barrel, we're gonna get one can of soup to help a family in need. But instead of get buying that soup, if you gave us the dollar, we would be able to turn it into four complete nutritious meals for a family in need by investing that dollar in our food recovery system. And that is where the beauty of this model lies. We also achieve significant decentralization of food rescue. We are now rescuing food from over 500 locations across San Diego County, and most of that food stays in the local community from which it's rescued. So decentralization means that instead of bringing all the food into a central repository in the middle of the county and then telling all of our charitable partners they now have to drive vehicles and haul it back to their home community, we just have the food make one short truck trip from a local grocery store to a local charity and it gets to families in need, oftentimes in the same day. Three things happen when you do that. One is you significantly reduce the carbon footprint of the overall hunger solution equation. Second thing is that the perishable foods, which are the healthiest products, are still consumable when they get to the consumer. And the third thing is you've achieved an incredible cost scalability of the model. We're at 260 grocery stores every day. Uh, we are at the airport, we're at the ballpark, we're even at the world famous San Diego Zoo, uh, rescuing food and getting it to families in need. Recently, the Starbucks Corporation approached us about a model a pioneering pilot project to rescue food from Starbucks stores. Now, there are 30,000 Starbucks stores across the globe, and they started the pilot here in San Diego at one store. And then we got momentum, and we expanded to 30 stores. And then the momentum kept going, and we expanded to where now we rescue food from 204 Starbucks stores across San Diego County nearly every night of the year. That's over 750,000 pounds of breakfast sandwiches, paninis, yogurts, protein boxes, uh, bakery items that we can get to families in need on a daily basis. That model, speaking of momentum, has now been expanded to 20 other US cities, and I just uh, met with Starbucks executives, and their intent is to take the program nationwide and even to global scale. So that's a great win for San Diego. But we have a long way to go. The Feeding America Map the Meal Gap study suggests that there are about 65 million meals needed in this county to close the gap between what people have access to and what people need to nourish their families. We're distributing over 25 million meals per year, but we want to close the hunger gap completely. We want to expand. The biggest business problem that we have as an organization is the availability of donated food is growing so much faster than the distribution capacity of our network. Isn't that a wonderful problem to have? So we're just trying to convince more organizations that do other things for people struggling with poverty to add this to their work so that they can solve the problem of hunger for everyone in their communities. The best part for us is that 97% of all the food that we're distributing is rescued food that would otherwise go to the landfill and create those environmental consequences, 97%. And we do that on a budget that relies on the government for less than 5% of our funding. Over 95% of what funds our operation is the generous philanthropy of people from our county and across the country. So this is an opportunity to scale and to grow and to solve this problem for ever more people. The reality is that turning to the food rescue model solves two problems at once, and they are two problems that we cannot afford to ignore any longer. We have to solve hunger in our communities, and we also have to solve the problem of food waste, which is creating these serious environmental consequences. I'm very proud to lead an organization that is working on both sides of that equation and doing everything within its power to scale this across the country and to help every community have, meet the needs that it has. Doing a food rescued approach to hunger relief is not only great for people struggling with hunger, it's really great for the environment, it's great for the taxpayer, and it's great for the future of our country. Thank you.